Ireland versus Liechtenstein, 1995, nil-nil. We couldn't beat them. Mortal! By all accounts, the most embarrassing defeat in Irish football in history. Liechtenstein is a micro-principality of 38,000 people, a football team of vets, plumbers and teachers who kick a ball around of an evening. And Ireland with our Premier Leaguers. And our Irish granny rule. Couldn't score against them. Morto, absolutely morto. <coughs> I was in Northern Ireland for the weekend and I can still remember desperately trying to listen to it on medium wave radio, having spent an hour running in and out of pubs in Bangor, trying to find someone who'd show it. What I discovered was there may have been peace in the north, but there was no love for the Republic soccer team. 23 years on, and I can still remember the extreme emotion I felt when that match ended. Ireland's most humiliating defeat was Liechtenstein's moment of ultimate supreme glory. Every once in a while it's good to remind myself that you can't have one without someone else having the other. Your defeat is someone else's victory. The world is a great big lollopin weighing scales of victories and defeats. Up until <clears throat> quite recently I was an extremely poor but remarkably enthusiastic soccer player until I injured my knee and that was that. Neymar, you're safe. My poor but enthusiastic soccer aspirations are over. I took up gardening, got an allotment. Didn't like it, chucked it in. Carrots are boring. Upshot is that scoring goals is a lot more fun than digging potatoes. We try not to have our head in screens when there's people over. Sets a bad example. I mean, how are you meant to get them not to do it if you're doing it yourself? Still, I'm addicted, like addicted. Podcast, news, Audiobooks, sport. I got it from my dad. 85 years of age and he was never without the latest iPhone. <laughs> he used to watch Sky Sports in it way back when the internet was still expensive. Cost him a fortune. Might as well go to the actual match. Still, latest iPhone at 85. <laughs> Pretty cool dad, hey? It's funny what keeps you connected. When I was working in the Iran-Iraq border, well, way back in the pre-broadband 90s, far away was very, very far away. What you were doing was a mystery. All I had to do talk with to head office was a telex machine. Kudunk, kudunk, kudunk. Richard Dixon here, kudunk, reporting on the humanitarian status of kudunk, kudunk. And I couldn't type. Binary symbol communication methods have no autocorrect. God knows what they were getting. There's a big difference between situation got better and situation not better. <laughs> now, I could be in Ethiopia, downtown Addis Ababa, and I'll get a message from the Tyrrellstown Community Action Group about the threat to the 40D bus service to the city centre. <laughs> it's changed society, hasn't it? The way we connect. We've gained so much. Maybe lost something too. Silence. Silence and distance are a test of belief in a person. Your belief in them and their belief in you. And by the way, in case you think I'm Jason Bourne, I'm not. I work for the charity Concern. 
in the reception area of our offices, there's a mission statement up on the wall, done up in big letters. Our vision for change is a world where no one lives in poverty, fear or oppression, where all have access to a decent standard of living and the opportunities and choices essential for a long, healthy and creative life. A world where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. That's the plan, anyway. Socks. You go to work, you get up in the morning and go to work, have a meeting about what to put in a policy document for Leo Radker about how to solve world hunger, then you go home and you do this with socks. If ever you happen to become the parent to ten-year-old siblings, you will never in your life ever have to buy another pair of socks. Socks, oh, well there's my uh, Christmas Day ones, my Father's Day ones, somewhere there's a pair of tie-dyed ones, especially custom tie-dyed for my own birthday. <laughs> there's no occasion in the history of family celebrations where a decent pair of socks will not suffice as a token of undying, unyielding love and affection, such as the beauty of socks. <clears throat> Travel changes you. It changes your relationship with people. Because when you travel so much with work, and you see the things you see, Next thing you know, you're home again. It's some gear change. You go from North Korea to North Strand, Haiti to ham, cheese and coleslaw sandwiches, the pub, rain, chips, Emmerdale, the Sunday game. And you're down the local, watching the match with your school pals. And one of them says, uh, where were you this time? How did it go? Where were you? Uh, Rwanda. Yeah, how was it? And you go, hot. What else do you say? How do you think Rwanda was? Hot. It's all they want to know. Able for. Their eyes drift back up to the match like a pair of naughty schoolboys after getting caught by a teacher. And you're thinking, I went to school with you. We learnt the same things. How did I become me and you become you? How was it? Hot. Disinterest in politics is a privilege. They've told themselves, oh, that's nothing got to do with them, but you're sitting there going to yourself, <laughs> oh, yes, it has. It has everything to do with you. You are a citizen of this planet. The world doesn't end at your garden gate. Everything that happens on this blue and green ball has to do with everyone. We're all connected. You with your pint of Guinness in your hand and your Tato crisps in front of you and your Toyota Corolla in your driveway. You can't be putting petrol in your car and telling me all that stuff in the Middle East, nothing got to do with you. But you don't say all that because they'll accuse you of going awful serious since you started working at that place and you're no crack. <laughs> and that's the worst thing in the world, to be no crack if you're Irish. Can you... Niger, Rwanda, Zambia, Egypt, Burundi, Mozambique, Haiti, Iran, Iraq, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Saudi, Thailand, the States, Af uh, Australia, China, Canada. Hot. <laughs> I met Maura in Chicago, the day I arrived in Chicago, 1999. I'd just come back from Kosovo. I was 32. 32, as it turns out, is the official age for saying to yourself, I could keep doing this or I could stop doing this. If I keep doing this, I will be doing this forever and there will be things I will never have, like a personal life. But if I stop doing this, there will be a chance of other things, like a wife family, home. So when they asked me if I'd set up a Chicago office in 1999, I went, sure, did I travel while you're staying still? I could do that. I'd be happy to do that. 
I hadn't a clue what I was doing. Like, I hadn't an actual clue. All I knew was, if I got up in the morning, put on a shirt and tie, go into an empty office and sit there for nine hours, I'd work it out eventually. <laughs> it's the strangest thing, putting on a tie to spend all day in a room where no one knows you're wearing one. <laughs> Somehow, though, they help you convince yourself you've half a notion of what you're doing. Every few weeks I had a conference call to New York for an update. There I am, in the Chicago branch, in my shirt and tie, all alone. Oh, yes, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's going well. <laughs> now, you go on the Concern website and it says offices in Dublin, Belfast, London, Seoul, New York, Chicago. Shirt and tie. And determination. And Maura, the peroxide blonde from County Clare who spent all of 90 seconds in the typing pool in the Department of Agriculture before she went, what am I doing? Grabbed her handbag and off she went. Chicago. She's the other good reason for putting on a shirt and tie in the morning. I met her the day after I moved over. She was organising a fundraiser for Concern, which I was scheduled to attend. It could not have been more perfect if I'd walked in the room with a sign around my neck saying, male, 32, desperately seeking woman, help. <laughs> and... Desperately it was, I fell in love. Leap year, 29th of February. She proposed to me. Then a few months later I proposed back. And we drove to the Diamond District of New York City to buy the ring, which probably cost us twice as much, but you can't put a price on a good story. And we got married in County Clare, and her parents did set dancing at the wedding. Maura and my two left feet danced to... Nat King Cole's L-O-V-E. I stomped about the place like I was trying to drill a hole into Middle Earth. But you can't not dance on your wedding day. <clears throat> then we moved to Tyrrellstown, where we made our home. You know, of all the places I have ever been, I can easily say that Tyrrellstown is the most exotic. <laughs> because Tyrrellstown is not just... Uh, a load of brick boxes and roundabouts tacked onto the back of the Blanchardstown shopping centre. Tyrrellstown, unlike many other property principalities in the greater Dublin area, had properties, houses, where, where well, well, that the people who are not originally from Ireland could afford, if you get my drift. Consequently, there's, uh, there's Indians on the Camogie team, Africans, Chinese, Polish, Hungarian, Pakistani. For a man who's had the, prids, uh, the privilege of living among the four corners of the globe, it's a privilege to have the four corners of the globe living among me. <clears throat> we can't get a dog, I told them. No, we told them. Me and Maura. Because they back each other up on everything. The three of them, I mean, you have to, otherwise you're doomed. There's no uh, ask your dad or go ask ma'am. No, 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 no. We were firm from the beginning. Girls, we'd all love a dog. But with the three of you, and the one of me, and the one of your ma'am, in a house this size, there's no room. And what about Tia, the turtle? big hairy monster of a dog chasing around the place, she'd be traumatised. She's particular enough as it is, aren't she? Wave to me through the window, through the glass, but she absolutely blanks your ma'am. No idea why. Plus, there's your ma'am's allergies. You know about that, girls? And with Tia's tank to clean and all the housework between us and who'll pick up the poo and go walkies and on top of, you know, making the dinner or picking you up after school taking it to sport, checking your spellings. Plus, 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 we're gone all day. We're gone all day. Dog, all alone, in the house, all day long. It's not right. I couldn't do that to an animal, could you? Silence. Out they go. One, two, three. Molly, Mia and Ellie. Bump, 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 up the stairs like a contrail of little ducks into one of the rooms upstairs for a cabinet discussion. Must have been the room directly above. 
You could hear them. Not enough to make out actual words, but enough to know they were strategizing, <laughs> planning st phase two. <laughs> There's nothing more frightening in the world than the sound of three children planning. <laughs> About an hour later, boom, 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 in they come. Ma'am, Dad, we would like to call a family meeting. <laughs> More and me have only ourselves to blame. We taught them about politics, about equal rights. We actively encouraged, uh, you know, freedom of expression, the power of respectful negotiation. In, in effect, we gave them the skills required to overthrow the system. <laughs> and there we were on our own living room sofa getting a vote of no confidence from her own children. <laughs> Molly leads the charge. Out comes the chalkboard, complete <laughs> with PowerPoint presentation. My name is Molly Dixon. I like GAA and gymnastics. When I grow up, I'm going to be a builder, probably in Turlstown. Today, I'm speaking on behalf of me and my sisters, Mia and Ellie, and I would like to start by presenting the three main reasons why we can't have a dog. Number one, ma'am has allergies and the dog would make her sneeze. Number two, the dog needs walks and has to go to the toilet. Number three, the dog would be lonely. These are the main reasons why we can't have a dog. I will now outline the solutions. <laughs> Number one. We will get a dog that doesn't shed and is good for allergies. We've looked some up on the internet and options are available. <laughs> Number two, we will clean up after and walk the dog. Number three, we will donate a section of our weekly pocket money, which will easily cover the cost of a professional dog minder, which will come every day and visit the dog. Now I have outlined that there are easy solutions to all of these problems, I will now invite my sisters, Mia and Ellie, to sing a song they wrote themselves about getting a dog. <laughs> Hello, our names are Ellie and Mia. I am Ellie. I like singing and GAA and gymnastics. Gymnastics. When I am buying socks for Dad, when I grow up, I would like to be president like Michael D. Higgins, not like Donald Trump. And I'm Mia. I like dogs. And I like Dobby, the elf from Harry Potter. And um, I like ponies. And I have 17 dolls and 3,000 Barbies. When I grow up, I want to be president like Michael Higgins. Thank you. Now we will sing a song that we wrote ourselves about getting a dog. Oh, we want a dog so much, we'd love it every day. We'd feed and clean it all the time, and every day we'd play. We love you, Mum, we love you, Dad. We love Tea the Turtle, too. A dog as well is not so bad, because we'd always love all of you. And I'm looking at Mia Dixon. She was two pounds, three ounces when she was born. Two pounds, three ounces. Hole in the heart. Last of the three to come home. And look at her now. So. This is Teddy. <laughs> our five months old miniature bees on freeze. He's French. Oh yeah, he's French. He doesn't speak French, but he eats snails. <laughs> which is why I'm not allowed to kiss him when he's been in the garden. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you, Molly. We love this house. We'll be moving soon. Space. We need a bigger kitchen. Well, we don't need a bigger kitchen. We would like a bigger kitchen. You need a triple bypass, you need floodplains, no one needs a bigger kitchen. We could have knocked that wall there, of course. Did an open plan thing, extended into the yard, but then where would they play? Space. That's the main topic of conversation after you turn 32. Oh, no space. What do we do with the yoke and where do we put the thing? You have to be careful with space, though. There's so much space 
in the world. Space is not a problem, it's a desire. Space is only a problem if you have three kids in a one bed flat in Donna Mead. And the only space you have is in the kitchen cupboard because all you've got is a box of cornflakes to feed the kids for dinner for, th for the week. And you've no idea how you're going to pay next month's rent. Then you'll have all the space you want because they'll kick you out. And if you're lucky, they'll put you in a hotel where you've no space and no kitchen. So, yeah. I'm the luckiest man alive. Because I get to come home every day and do this. When you're the grown-up, you have a responsibility to make your home a happy place for the human beings that you create and bring into it. I want these walls to reflect the soul of us. A chamber for debate, a haven for the heartaches, a parliament of love, a port in life's storms, a theatre for all the drama. A world where no one lives in poverty, or fear, or oppression. Where we all have access to a decent standard of living and the choices and opportunities essential for a long, healthy and creative life. A world where everyone is treated with dignity and respect. A home. That's the plan, anyway. And when I'm in these four walls with Maura, Molly, Mia, Ellie, Teddy, and Tia the Turtle, it doesn't matter what's going on outside them. As long as everyone is safe and happy inside, it's all you can do. And when I'm in bed at night, I can say, Well done, Richard Dixon. You have a wife, three little girls, a gender biased turtle, a dog who's French and eats snails, and today you didn't break them. Oh, Liechtenstein. Ireland, nil, nil, Liechtenstein. <laughs> Liechtenstein. You have to hand it to them, don't you? <laughs>